my friends, please be seated. Okay, friends, it's a new beginning. Uh, we are in Advent. As you know, it is our new year as Christians. So happy new year. That started last week, Advent 1. And if you remember, we start a four-part drama of really reflecting on what does it really mean to be a Christian as we prepare for the Incarnation. That's Christmas, the Feast of the Incarnation. The Incarnation is Jesus Christ. It's the God incarnate in word, now walks amongst us with arms and legs and hands and the whole thing, Jeannie. It's a whole human being, but also God. Um, so before we get there, though, as a church throughout history that we've said there's these four proponents, at least the Episcopal Church holds up, that's the fabric, the DNA of what does it really mean to be a Christian. So quiz time here, as Tammy was over here lighting the candles, and Clint, next time she does this, you need to be up here with her, and Bella, the whole family. Oh, you guys are all here? You left your mom up here alone? Clint, I'm coming for you. All right, so friends, the first candle, what's that first part of our DNA as a Christian? Father Joe preached on it last week. Hope! And he gave a great acronym. What was that acronym? And the lady looked, up at it, looked at him and said, you're welcome. Remember that? Okay. All right, cool. I just make sure we're all here. Okay. All right. Uh, and then now, this week, we're going to be focusing on what? Peace. All right. Anyone want to get, uh, get real, get real uh, uppity and know what next week is? Joy. There we go. The pink candle, Mary's candle. And then finally, we end with? Okay, great. So we follow the way of love, as our presiding bishop says. So, friends. Let's talk about peace today, uh, and this is, I'm telling you, these four are part of the fabric of what it means to be a Christian, because it is not easy to pick up your cross and to follow Christ. You pick up your cross, and we talked about this before, it doesn't mean when you say, that's my cross to bear, doesn't mean, oh, my bad back, that's my cross to bear, or I gotta deal with my, you know, my, 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 my uh, uh, angry little child, that's my cross to bear in this life. No, a cross to bear is to literally pick up your cross like Jesus Christ did and offer yourself in love to this world. That's the cross. That's offer. That's your cross to bear. I bear my cross. I bear the burdens of this world to walk and to be with you and walk with you and to empathize with you and to choose love and compassion over judgment uh, and divisiveness. This is, this is the, the, the cross to bear. Are you prepared to pick up that cross and follow Christ? What does that mean? You have hope, which we talked about last week. If you missed it, you can just watch the YouTube video, Jeannie. You see how that works? Okay. Now this week, we're going to talk about peace. And all in the midst of this, Christians, we are not hallmark Christians. We don't just pretend that the world is just perfect and fine, and once you get saved and baptized, everything's all good to go. Actually, it gets a little more challenging than that. Uh, because now, the world's problems become your problems because your heart breaks for those problems, and you want to find the kingdom uh, healing in the midst of those problems. You want to see the chaos and see the war, and you are called into the trenches to do the work that God has given you to do if you want to follow Jesus. And so today, how are you going to find peace in the midst of that war? How do you find peace in the midst of that war? Well, Father Joe, I'm glad you asked that question, because in the gospel today, we have Mark who's kicking us off. He is our new gospeler. It's the start of a new year, and every year in the Episcopal Church, we have a new gospeler who leads us in our story and understanding of Jesus Christ. Uh, we have how many gospels? Yes. Okay, great. Um, now, most scholars would agree Mark wrote the first gospel in 70 A.D. Uh, for other reasons we'll get into later, Matthew became the first gospel that was listed in the Bible. But Mark is the first. That's our gospeler now. We just finished with Matthew. He had a certain camera angle that he was using on the Jesus story. It's all the same story. Matthew had his camera angle, and he had his audience he was speaking to, and what he wanted to get across was, I got a bunch of Jews that I want to say, hey, we found the Messiah, come follow me. So everything he's doing is trying to get the Jews on board his fellow Jews. Mark, different story. Mark's in 70. What just happened in 70 AD? There was an uprising. The Jews stood up in the first rebellion against Rome and said, we're not going to take it anymore. And Rome said, that's cute. And they completely demolished them, and they burned their temple to the ground. So just imagine an, uh, another force coming in to Vatican City, which is its own city, and saying, all of you Catholics and this whole Vatican City is now occupied. And uh, the Vatican Guard said, no way. Everyone rose up against them. And that occupy, the occupying country said, that's cute. And they burned the whole Vatican to the ground. That's what we're talking. That's the humiliation and the loss. Just one more for the Jewish people they experienced in 70 AD during this uprising. So Mark 
comes in the midst of this war, in the midst of this battle, in the midst of this loss. And I'm going to change over to the NRSV. We heard the message uh, before. And the NRSV, he has the audacity. Now remember the gospel, Mark's, is not meant to be read. It, it's meant to be spoken and listened to. So he is this picture of this. He's going to come in the midst of this war, and he's going to start off by saying, the beginning. Okay, now in Greek, this beginning, translate it back to where it came from, translating from the Hebrew, this idea of the beginning, has, that Greek word has a relationship to the Hebrew word that's used in Genesis for the beginning of it all. When God created creation, he created creation in the midst of the chaos, it says in Genesis. So Mark, he's a smart Jew, he knows what he's doing to his people. So this is the beginning. He's talking about a brand new beginning. A new beginning, a new creation is happening in the midst of this war. Well, if you guys got one of these, feel free to follow along with me. Uh, the beginning of what? And he says, the good news. The good news. You see this temple, it's burning. Cinders. I lost my aunt, my cousin. I lost half my family. You're talking about the good news? What Mark is doing is that he's using a word, the evangel evangelium, this good news that was used only by the emperor. The emperor and his people will come into a town after the Pax Romana came in, the peace of Rome. And the peace of Rome means we just demolish you and you follow us. We got peace, right? So that's the way that peace was done through the Roman way. Mark is taking that. He's repurposing it and saying, no, the way of this king I'm about to tell you about is different. So this good news um, is about this person called Jesus Christ. And the translation of Jesus, if we go back to the Hebrew translation of what that would be, would be Yeshua. Yeshua means Joshua. It's just a name. Who's this Joshua dude? Well, Yeshua, Joshua, Christ. Christ? You mean the anointed one? The one we've been waiting for? The person we've been talking about in Micah and Amos and Isaiah that we just heard about? He's here? He's finally arrived to save us? Because boy, do we need him. You see that temple? And Mark continues on. Yeah, Jesus the Christ. And then he has the audacity to call him what? The Son of God. Again, context is everything. When we read the Bible, get one of those Bibles that come with all the notes at the bottom. You learn so much, especially with those real challenging passages that are controversial. You'll learn a lot. And he talks about the Son of God. Well, who is the Son of God in a Roman context? Emperor. The Emperor. You can't do that. You went to seminary. Okay. <laughs> Caesar dies, and they, Caesar gets what? He gets deified. He's the God. So Octavius comes in, who's his relative. So now Octavius is the Son of Come on, Choppy. God, son of God. Mark is being a rebellious peacemaker. He is coming in the midst of the war, in the midst of the loss, right in front of the face of the enemy, and he says, no, 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 no. We have a new beginning that's going to rise from this ashes. That's good news. Not the Pax Romana good news, but the good news of compassion, love, of mercy, and forgiveness. You all are going to be saved from your sin from this guy. Who is it? Yeshua Christ. Joshua. Who is Joshua in the Bible? Joshua was the one who took the mantle from Moses to lead us into a new way. He crossed the Jordan River, Joshua, and we were into Cana and the Holy Land. So there's a new beginning. This is the new Joshua. Because he goes on to talk about uh, John the Baptist. He's like the Moses character, handing off the mantle to Joshua. So now we got John the Baptist handing the mantle off to Jesus. This is all new, guys, a new creation. So come with me. And he is the Son of God. Not the warmongerer who just destroyed us, this man. And if you follow this man, if you follow this God, you can have hope beyond hope. You can have peace that's beyond all understanding, as it says in Philippians 4, 4, 7. If you follow this, you will find a, a mercy and a love and a joy in the midst of it all, my friends. This is the peace that we want to attract and have in our life, friends. You have a war in your life right now. When we got war going on, that's not going to change. We are in a world of chaos. Heaven came to earth in the form of Christ, but this ain't heaven yet. We have been called, if you pick up your cross, to reveal heaven here on earth. So his will on earth as it is in heaven is done. That's your call as a Christian. Your call as a Christian is to pick up that cross and become a revealing more and more light, more joy, more peace, more hope, more love. However, you can't give away what you don't have. So before we start talking about how are we going to change this world and do all that, you've got to change yourself. 
You can't give away what you don't have. So if you are at war in yourself right now, friends, if there is a chaos inside of your heart right now, if there is something that is limiting you for accepting the peace of, that's beyond all understanding, my friends, this is the space for you to surrender and give it to the cross. That's what being saved by Jesus Christ is. Stop the war within your own heart. What keeps you up at night? What makes you leave behind your, your Christian values and turn more to anger and to frustration and to venom and to division? We all got it. We're all human. None of us are above it. I sure am not. If I don't pray, if I don't worship, if I don't read that Bible, if I don't confess my sins, if I don't go out there and do the work that God is calling me to do, friends, I am lost, and I will join the war. This peace is beyond all understanding. It doesn't make any sense, because you can't do it on your own. When you have a frenemy in your life, and they turn more into the enemy, and they're starting to drive you nuts because they're talking about that politician that you can't stand, and you're like, I can't believe I'm friends with this person, I can't believe she believes in this person, I can't believe she's voting for this guy, oh my gosh, I want to hate her. you got to go to Jesus and say, God, this is my sister in Christ, and you are the peace that's beyond understanding. When you have a hatred or an anger or a frustration with something that's going on in your life right now, and you're saying, why God me, why God me, like the Psalms do, get it all out, get all that anger, be honest about it, and then say, come Lord, give me that peace that's beyond all understanding. We are not just following a rabbi who gives us good teachings of how to do good life. We are talking about a supernatural cosmic force in the man of Jesus Christ who will change your life, as the message said today. And it, it is work every day. It's work every day. And the more that we do that together as a church, the more that we can go on and continue to make our dent in this society, can go on and do, make our dent in doing things like getting an imam and a rabbi and a priest and a pastor on stage to say, we want the kingdom of God. We want peace. And we're going to do whatever we can in this moment. There are glimmers of this peace when you've got to grab it. And you've got to go for it, friends. You look at Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King, this man had the peace of God within him. How did he have the peace of God within him when he was being attacked, when he was being persecuted? You know, when they did an autopsy on his heart, they found that he had the heart of an 80-year-old man. That's how much stress was upon him because he was so worried about dying, so worried about the movement. But you listen to him and you read his diaries and, you, and, and, and his letter from the Birmingham jail. This man has a tremendous peace that's inside him. How did he find that peace in the midst of so much chaos? Let's just go with who we heard today. The Apostle Paul. Oh, actually, we didn't hear it today. You'll hear it at the other service. He talks about joy and this peace that gives him just calm. He's in a Roman prison. He's sitting in his own coop. He's chained to the wall. He doesn't know if he's going to last another day, but yet, I'm good, God. Because his peace is not predicated in outside circumstances. His peace is because he knows he's loved and cared for and protected by Jesus Christ. So I'm good. You can't take away my peace because you don't control my peace. It's Almighty God who grounds me, who validates me, who makes me complete, and then sends me out to go give it away to others. So what you say, what you do, that doesn't take it away from me because I have an eternal peace. During the uh, World War I in 1914, I'm sure you guys might be familiar with the story. I wasn't, um, <laughs> but you know me. I, mean, I, I need to learn a lot. Um, so uh, in 1914, you had the Christmas truce, if all you're familiar with that. Uh, and so you have the German soldiers and the, and the British soldiers and Pope Benedict try to, try to uh, claim a, 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 um, a truce worldwide in the war. And, and both powers came to be and said, uh, no, that's not going to happen. And so the soldiers during that time, um, in, on Christmas Eve in, su in southern Belgium, uh, the German soldiers at night from their trenches started to sing, um, oh, uh, started to sing, oh, holy night in German. And they're singing that, and the British soldiers are like, do you hear this? Do you hear what's going on? Um, and then because of that, of hearing the hymn, of hearing the night, of the Prince of Peace being sung about, they started to respond with the first Noel. And throughout that whole night in southern Belgium, with bullets and all the technology of war in front of them, these soldiers throw all the enemy part away, and they're just singing about Jesus. And finally, one German soldier who knows some English, and then they, they start piecing this together because they've read all these guys' diaries. One shouts over, hey, you have any wine? <laughs> 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 uh, 
Oh, yeah. He's like, well, come on over here. And, 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 they, and they, 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 uh, uh, they said, well, let's meet halfway. And so the British soldiers go halfway to meet with them, and they, and, and they shake hands. And, and then they said, okay, you got any cigarettes? And they start exchanging gifts of wine and cigarettes. And then one guy, a British guy, he's a barber. <laughs> And he starts cutting guys' hair. And, and then another guy finds a, a soccer ball, or I guess a football, that's what we call it, and uh, a football. And they start playing soccer. To this, to this day, they actually do a friendly match between Germany and England to, 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 to recognize this. Uh, and, and they start playing soccer. And for the whole night, into Christmas Day, into the light, they're celebrating each other as just brother and brother. No longer enemies. We're all God's children. And what started it was this peace that came, the light that we were waiting for on Christmas Day was from singing and praising God. That's what started it. They could have been singing other music, but they were singing, they were starting that Christmas Eve hope. And all the walls of war melted away. Now, at the end, they hugged each other and they said, listen, you got to fight for your country, I'm going to fight for mine, may the best man win. And they went back and many lives were lost, as we know. But it was that sliver of hope, that sliver of peace that says this can't happen. Rome doesn't have to win. There's another kingdom way of doing this. And the, it starts with praise. It starts with our God. It starts with putting God first. My, my, my good friend Dan, I've talked to him about him before. He's, a, he, he's a, a Jewish guy who leads teams to Israel for them to, 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 to get land. And then his wife is Ukrainian who has friends in Kiev or family in Kiev. So they got a two-front war going on in their lives. I'm like, Dan, I was trying to prepare for the sermon. How do you find peace when you both are trembling to pick up the phone every night to hear about what's happening. He's got colleagues who have family who were taken hostage. He's like, Christian, I think about these mothers in Joppa, the diverse city. Muslim women, Jewish women, who make a public pronouncement and come together once a week, and they eat together, and they weep together, and they love together, because they say, we're not going to be a part of this hatred. We're going to push back on that, and we're going to celebrate this peace. He goes, when I hear about that, and I see that, and I hear about that from colleagues, that gives me hope, and that calms my heart. There are these slivers, friends, of the kingdom just poking through the destruction, poking through the sin, and there are these holes in your own life where the war is trying to take you and to divert you and to detour you. It's the part where you're in the fight with your spouse, and you could just keep on going if you want. You get even worse. You could say something real stupid, and for whatever reason, though, the hope of peace pokes through and says, okay, buddy, <laughs> Do you want to be right or do you want to be married, right? And, and it just pulls you back and the peace of God comes over and you're like, oh, it wasn't that important. I love you so much. You give a hug and it's all done, right? Hopefully. <laughs> you are ambassadors of peace. But you've got to start first with what is your internal war. Before we take the sacrament, every time we take the sacrament, it is like an altar call. We are coming up to profess our belief that Jesus Christ is our Savior, and do you believe this loving God can heal your darkest of wounds and your darkest of chaos that's inside of you right now that's holding you back from fully embracing the living Christ in your life? Because this peace that's beyond understanding doesn't happen from intellectually knowing Jesus. It only comes through a relationship with him, by knowing him, studying his word, praying to him. This morning... I tried centering prayer. So you're going to preach about peace. You better do something about it. And so I sat there, and, you know, Thomas Kempis has this whole thing he talks about centering prayer, and Thomas Merton, and, and, and just sit there and say, come, Lord Jesus, overtake my heart. Help me sense that peace that's beyond understanding. Guys, that's beautiful. It's beautiful. You know, I'm, I'm a, kind of, you know, I, it's hard for me to sit still, as you can tell, as I've probably run 15 <laughs> laps already. So for a guy like me, that's important if I'm going to try to preach peace and walk in peace so I don't act out emotionally and do stupid things. <laughs> it's important, right, Kate? <laughs> okay, that's enough, Kate, all right? <laughs> what are your tools of peace, friends, for you to say, come, Prince of Peace, overtake my life. Help me not to be controlled by my circumstance, but be controlled by you as the Prince of Peace. Help me to find it in the midst of the chaos. Help me to find it in the midst of the war. Help me to follow all the other communion of saints who have found that same peace. And when, you, friends, you have that, it is contagious. And people will want it. And they'll say, how do you have peace knowing all the stuff that's going on around you? Because of Jesus. Because he loves me. And I just want to give it away to you. Happy Advent, brothers and sisters.
Claim that peace, because Jesus gave it to you. My peace I give to you. My peace I leave with you. May we please stand together for the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate for the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and 